Ephesians chapter 2, we are continuing our study on the path into Christ from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. The path into Christ from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true words of God. Every believer in Jesus Christ since the day of Pentecost almost 2,000 years ago, will be at this event as the bride of Christ. We know what Revelation chapter 19 is talking about because the symbolism that it speaks of, the lamb and the bride are used without any question, especially in Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23, when comparing the marriage relationship between husband and wife, it says, For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. It is clear who the Lamb is. It is clear who the bride is. The Lamb is Jesus Christ. The bride is is the church, and any person who is a member of the church, which happens how? Believe, and then God, without you ever even knowing it, takes you spiritually, the Spirit does this, and immerses you. The term that Scripture, as we've translated it, says, is baptizes you into Jesus Christ, fully immerses you so that you are perfectly identified with Jesus Christ. In fact, is that not what we've been talking about ever since the very beginning of Ephesians chapter 1, being in Christ. So this is not the final place. No, this is just the beginning of eternity for the church to be wed to Jesus Christ. This is such an important scene. It's such a precious thing because there's already been a relationship established. There's already been a union between Christ and his church This is different because this is the public display of that union finally and fully. In Jewish wedding uh, customs, at least from around the time of Christ, and it took a couple thousand years to develop these customs, there are basically four stages to a marriage. The first stage is what is known as betrothal, and it would be similar, but there are differences. It would be similar to what an engagement would be in our society. There's a commitment made at some level, but betrothal is actually a lot stronger. It almost even has the force of, if it's separated, being on a level that would be similar to divorce. So it's a very serious commitment. The difference is betrothal starts with and this can even happen when, at least in these times, when um, people were children, their parents could set this up, but there would be a dowry paid to the woman's family. And that would be a contractual commitment for their marriage. And then at least, depending on if they're adults or not, at least a year would have to go by before they could actually be married. This time was very, very important. It was a time of preparation. The husband would go and he would start preparing a place for his bride. That's actually the background of terminology from John chapter 14. When Jesus says, in my father's house are many dwelling places. And if I go, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. John chapter 14. He is talking about, he's using the imagery of the man who's committed to a wife, 
and he's going to his father's house and he's preparing. And then the woman would prepare herself during that time by purifying herself and making sure that she remains pure. And if there was any impurity, and we're talking about if there was um, a lack of commitment, an affair that happens, it's not the best term for it, but that's maybe a sanitized term for it, then the marriage would be broken off. That's what this betrothal period was about. The second stage after betrothal was what has come to be known as fetching. It's time for him to go and get his bride. The day has come, and he's going to take her back to his father's house. And so, again, that goes back into that John chapter 14 imagery. And then there is a ceremony. That's the third stage. A ceremony. And then right after the ceremony is a feast. And those feasts would last seven days. And we see that in John chapter 2 with the marriage that Jesus attends in Cana of Galilee. And so we see these types of things established historically, the customs of this marriage ceremony and the way that they would um, set themselves up for marriage. And again, in Ephesians chapter 5, we see another stage talked about without really even realizing when you read Ephesians 5, it's right there. This is one of those stages in Jewish customs. In verse 26 of Ephesians 5, it says that Christ gave himself up for the church that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Interesting. Verse 27, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. This is the preparation for the ceremony and the feast. That's the imagery that's being drawn on there, is that the woman would have a special consecrating cleansing ceremony before the time came to ready herself for her husband. And God, his spirit working through the Apostle Paul, is writing and explaining that the relationship that the church has to Christ is similar to this because we live in a time where physically there's a distance between us. Spiritually, there's no distance. But we are not physically in heaven right now. We are not at the marriage supper of the Lamb right now. Those things are yet future, and it is a time of preparation for the church in which God is sanctifying us, and he is producing things within us. And what's the source? the word. This is what washes us. This is what cleanses us. The word does this work. So what's very interesting about Revelation chapter 19 is, and if you compare your current life, what you experience, the practical side of the Christian life with what you read in Revelation 19, I think anyone who's honest would say those are two completely different worlds that it would say the, his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. That she's found to be holy and blameless, spotless, perfect. And the idea is, at this point in time, after the rapture has come, God Christ has collected his church out of the world that we're going to be in resurrected, glorified bodies. Sin is fully removed from our lives permanently and completely, and a purifying process happens at the beam of judgment in which anything of our lives which was of the quality of wood, hay, and stubble is burned up and taken away, and the gold, silver, and precious stones are there to last forever. And so even though every single individual Christian has sin in their lives, and some Christians will have less to show for their lives than others, the only thing that will be taken into account, the only thing that will be presented, the only thing that will be relevant will be the gold, silver, and precious stones that will be described in the marriage supper of the Lamb 
as fine linen for the bride of Christ to clothe herself with. It's so amazing to think about that the life that I experience now, which is so different from that, that I'm going to get that type of experience for real one day at the marriage supper of the Lamb with all the other saints before the Lord. And here's the key to it all. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 7, it starts it off. It says, and notice this wording, let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. God gets the glory for this. And that is a cause for all who see this to rejoice and be glad. God receiving glory, God and in the person of Jesus Christ displaying his bride before the world is a source of joy and gladness for all who see it. It's going to be very important for us to understand as we look at Ephesians chapter 2. Let's read from Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this amazing work that you have done, everything that you have provided, the simple path that is really just two steps. We know that every one of us started in the same place, dead in our trespasses and sins. We started in this position of being separated from you spiritually. And Lord, we thank you that not on the basis of anything we've done, not any effort that we could put in, not any way that we could rely on ourselves. You did the work that was impossible for us. And through Jesus Christ, his work on the cross, you have provided us everything we need to have an eternal relationship with you. And not only that, to be united to Christ so that when he was made alive, you count it that we were made alive. When he was raised from the dead to new life, you count it that we were raised from the dead. And when he was seated in the heavenlies, you count it that we, at this very moment, are in the heavenlies with Christ Jesus. Lord, help us to realize what is true about us spiritually. These things that are more real than even the things we see and hear and feel. Help us to inform the lives we live today, the experiences we have today, by what is already true about us. Help us to wrap our minds around all of these things that Christ has provided. And Lord, I pray that that would impact us each and every day to walk according to your word and never from a position of trying to merit and earn your favor for sanctification, but always from a position of you providing everything in us, that you are doing the work within us through your word, through our growth and understanding what you've provided us in our position, and that we would yield to the important things we see in Scripture. Lord, help us as we continue to grow in Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in our outline, 
we have been looking at God's intention. Again, we see this in verse 7 of Ephesians chapter 2. In the words, so that, this is indicating purpose. It is telling us God has a purpose for all this stuff that he's already done. What is that purpose? We talked about last time that his purpose is to proclaim grace. And we see that in specifically verses 7 through 9. That those three verses are all about God's ultimate purpose of making us alive, raising us up, and seating us with Christ is in the end to proclaim his grace. Now we're going to get more specific. How does God proclaim his grace? He does it by the demonstration. The demonstration. The demonstration is found in a single word in verse 7. It says, so that in the ages to come, he might show. He might show. That could be very appropriately translated that he might demonstrate the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. God wants to demonstrate his grace. This is a public display. It is a demonstration. It is a showing. He wants people to know about this. This word is used in a very interesting passage in the New Testament, and that's in Romans chapter 9, verse 17. Romans chapter 9, verse 17 says this, For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. Now, this is being quoted by the Apostle Paul in a section in which he is answering, what about Israel? Throughout the book of Romans, he has developed that everyone comes to God the same way. Justification, a righteous standing before God, is not given to the Jewish person, even though he is their God, he was their God first. It is not given to the Jewish person any other different way from anyone else. Everyone comes through Christ, through faith. That is the only path that is given. And so the question is asked, he asks it in Romans chapter 3, what advantage has the Jew? And he doesn't pick up that conversation until Romans chapter 9, and he starts answering that question again. What advantage has the Jew? We know there's something special about them being God's chosen people. If it's not justification, if it's not salvation, then what is the advantage? And so he explains his great burden for them because they are spiritually lost for the most part today, and yet they still are presently. He's talking about unbelieving Jews, by the way. They still are Israelites to whom belongs the adoptions and the glory and the covenants and the temple service and the promises, and he lists other things there. He's saying all of those things still right now belong to Jewish people, even if they have rejected Jesus as their Messiah. It's amazing stuff they have. So then the question is, how could people who have all those things still have all those things, have rejected their Messiah, and how could they be lost spiritually? And he explains, not All Israel are descended from Israel. Now, most people in Christianity want to take that and say, I'm a Gentile, and I'm born again in Christ, and so since I'm a part of the church today, I must be spiritual Israel. And so not all Israel are descended from Israel, but some of us who are outside that all must be a part of that. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying, take the whole, all Israelites. They must be Jewish genetically, by lineage, by heritage. And a small subset of them are what we would call true Israel. They are only Jewish people, though. But they are the ones who have believed in the Messiah. And he's making the point that it is through them that all of these promises and these things that have been given will come to fruition and will have their final end. To make that argument, he sets up three different situations in which God made a choice. In these situations, 
It has nothing to do with individual salvation. Not in any of the three. It has to do with God's plans for history and the people he chooses to be his servants. So he explains, there's Isaac. And Isaac was chosen and not Ishmael. And he's the child of the promise. What's the promise? The covenant promise that was given. So the promise doesn't go to Ishmael, it goes to Isaac. And then there's Jacob. And Jacob was chosen and not Esau. And here's a real big clue that we have that this has nothing to do with individual salvation. What is the thing that God chose Jacob for? It says in verse 12 of Romans 9, the older shall serve the younger. Does that sound like individual salvation to anyone? It's not what that passage is talking about. It's talking about God administering his plans for history and how he will fulfill them and that it's going to come through Jacob and not Esau. It has nothing to do with individuals getting saved and being chosen. You will be saved and you will be sent to hell. You will be saved and you will be sent to hell. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with people chosen to serve God's plans. Another way that we know that is it says in there, and this is a quotation from Malachi, in verse 13 of Romans 9, Paul says, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. How many hundreds of years after Jacob and Esau lived was that written? Hundreds of years after. They were long dead. Clearly, it has nothing to do with them as individuals at that point. It has to do with the nations that came from them and how God is working out his plans in history. And here's where this gets important for our purposes here. Then it comes to this individual, a very important person for the biblical history and story that's developed in the Bible, the Pharaoh and what God did through Pharaoh. And he says that Pharaoh was chosen for a purpose. It's a little bit different than what he did through Isaac and Jacob, but Pharaoh was chosen for a purpose. And God is even very patient with Pharaoh because he wants his name to be known. And Pharaoh is the perfect candidate to make that happen. That is a quotation from Exodus chapter 9, verse 16. It's brought right from the Hebrew into the Greek by Paul, and he's quoting from Exodus chapter 9, verse 16. And in this situation, there have already been six plagues that have come upon the nation of Egypt. Well, actually, this is the sixth one. And this is what some translations will call boils. Basically, it's just an open, festering sore, but it's all over people's bodies. It's nasty and horrible. They've already had the Nile River turn to blood, frogs, gnats, flies, uh, cattle um, dying. And now it's these boils or whatever type of skin wound this is. And in this situation, God is explaining why he's doing this. And not just why he's doing this, why he keeps on showing mercy to Pharaoh. He says in Exodus 9.16, again, Paul translates that into Greek in the book of Romans, but the wording is a little bit different in Hebrew, or at least it strikes you a little bit differently. It says in Exodus 9.16, for this reason, I have allowed you to remain. He doesn't say for this reason, I have raised you up. He says, for this reason, I've allowed you to remain. I could have wiped you out and killed you the very first time you opposed me. I haven't. I've shown you mercy, and I've shown you mercy, and I've shown you mercy time and time again. And there's only one reason for that. Because through this series of events, God is being made known more and more. This little people Israel who were the smallest of all nations, Deuteronomy 7 says, who were unknown, who were hidden within the nation of Egypt, are now going to be one of the most famous nations, if not the most famous nation, there has ever been. 
and their God is glorified through it. Here's the proof. What happened in the Exodus after the remaining plagues and the death of the firstborn and Pharaoh finally lets the people go and then when they're gone, he has a change of mind and he goes after them. He pursues them into the Red Sea. God parts the sea for the Israelites and when the Egyptians try to cross it, the waters are closed on them and they die. When Israel finally is ready to go into the land, you know what their experience is? They cross over the Jordan. Joshua sends in two spies into the city of Jericho. And those two spies go in trying to disguise themselves, and they find this woman named Rahab. And they are given a place to stay at Rahab's house. And yet, they are already known. Because somebody goes to the king in Jericho and says, Two of the sons of Israel are among us, and they're spying us out. So the king sends people to her house. Now think about that. Why would the people of Jericho, who prior to this were hundreds of miles away from the people of Israel, why would they know about this nation? How would they know about them? And yet they know, and they know that there are spies among them. And so the king goes, or he sends men, and they question. Rahab lies and says that the men have already taken off. And she provides shelter for them as they're on their reconnaissance mission. Here's what she says in Joshua chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. This is amazing. She says, or it says, And she said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land. Seriously, how would a Canaanite woman know anything about this? Where did she learn this? And she was a harlot. This is not a woman that would probably be the most well-educated, most informed. Maybe she would because she probably travels in a lot of different circles. But she would not be regarded as probably the most educated person in that society. And yet she says, I know that the Lord is giving you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. God's plan worked perfectly. God wanted to make his name known, he was going to use Pharaoh for that purpose. He kept showing Pharaoh mercy. And every time he shows Pharaoh mercy, Pharaoh hardens his heart. And so the opportunities keep going. Until finally, he does something so awful that the people are sent out. And yet still, Pharaoh goes after them. And now these people in Jericho know about it. They've heard the reports. They know what happened. This isn't the only situation like this either. You can think throughout the history of the Old Testament and even into the New Testament, there are several, we'll say, Gentile peoples or pagan peoples, people who are not of Israel, who know a great deal about them and what's going on. I don't have time to get into them, but I'll just list a couple of them. Remember the Queen of Sheba? The Queen of Sheba. Solomon was so famous... He was making, it says in uh, 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 1, the name of the Lord famous. He was so famous that the Queen of Sheba, hundreds of miles away in the Arabian Peninsula, takes a trip there because she wants to test him with difficult questions. And when she finally does it, she's blown away. Every report that she heard was exactly right, and even more, he was truly wise. That's a person who heard about what God was doing among the Israelites. And then the other example that I'll use is a New Testament example, but right as things are starting out in the New Testament, right at Jesus' birth, there's a group of men, it's not three, I don't know how many it was, who are called magi. And these magi, are they would sort of fit the role of priests, but they, in their government and their society, they sort of fit the role, not just of priests, but of kingmakers. They're very powerful people. 
and it's from the Parthian Empire. What's the Parthian Empire? It used to be the Persian Empire. And after its fall and some changes, it formed into this less powerful but still very um, influential empire. And here are these magi, priestly astronomers, and they have come following a light in the sky all the way to Israel looking for the place where this king is going to be born. How would these people know anything about this? Who in Israel was looking for that? Is there testimony in Scripture of other people, Jewish people who knew the Scriptures, walking around, following a light, trying to find where the Messiah was going to be born? Yet these pagan people somehow know that a king is going to be born in Israel? How did they know that? They were influenced by Israel. And the best we can gather is maybe the prophet Daniel and his 70 weeks prophecy led them to some logical conclusions about the time frame. And then as it got closer, they were, to make, they were able to make deductions. And perhaps, I don't know how this would all work, but the Lord working through celestial signs granted them something that he normally doesn't grant. We don't exactly know how that works. What we do know is Gentile people who were not of Israel, they were not of the people of God, they had no national relationship to the one true God, knew about him. He was famous. They were seeking him. This is exactly the point. God wants to make himself known and to display things about himself, not just in Israel, but through Israel to all people. We'll have to pick this up next week. This is the last thing I'll say here. What was the purpose of Israel as a nation in the first place? This is revealed in Exodus chapter 19. When the people have been saved from Egypt, they've come through the Red Sea, and God is starting to form this relationship with this nation who's going to start wandering through the wilderness. They get to Mount Sinai, and God wants to enter into a national covenant with them. And this covenant is conditional that you do certain things, I do certain things. You fail to do certain things, you face consequences. And so in this covenant, God says in Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 through 6, Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples. For all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. There's three things he says that they will be. The one that is very important for our purposes in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 17, in God demonstrating things before others, is that the nation of Israel was to be a kingdom of priests, not a kingdom with priests. A kingdom of priests, the priestly kingdom. We'll have to get into this next week, but they made a misstep in Exodus 19 that I believe, and I think the text bears out, that led to them not being a priestly kingdom at that time, missing out on an immense opportunity, and having priests among them instead. It demoted them and their role. And yet God still used them. And he is using us today and will use us in the future to demonstrate things to all the creation. Everything that can hear and can see is going to learn a great deal about God through what he's done with us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the work that you are doing in the church and the things you have set up for the future. Lord, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7 is uh, such a powerful verse. It talks about this eternal plan that you have, these goals that are at the very end of things and that continue on forever. And it is so easy for us to, like so many other passages, to read right over it and to not see just how significant your work is and the things you are doing are. And that we get to be a part of this. That in essence, 
you are holding us out like a trophy, a trophy that you love, that makes you glad, and a trophy that gets to be glad because of what you've done with us and through us. And Lord, thank you for the eternity that we get with you because of Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.